Okay, um, why don't we get started? So it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Ben Lev um, as our colloquial speaker today. Um, in a way, it's a homecoming for Ben because Ben received his PhD here in 2005, working with uh, Professor Hedaya Mabuchi. Uh, during his PhD, Ben worked on fabricating and utilizing magnetic micro traps to perform on chip BEC experiments, cavity QED, atom optics experiments. Um, following that, Ben received the prestigious National Research Council postdoctoral fellowship um, to work with Professor Junier at Villa uh, in Colorado. And during the time in Colorado, um, Ben somewhat switched gears and started looking at laser cooling of polar molecules and also performed spectroscopic measurements um, on molecules like hydroxyl radicals, OH. Um, ben then spent three years as an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, um, and then moved to Stanford, where he now holds professorial positions in both physics and applied physics. And during his time as faculty, he's done a number of experiments, um, largely studying phenomena related to quantum many-body physics and many-body dynamics, but uniquely employing tools at the interface of Commence matter physics, quantum optics, and AMO techniques. And so for his body of work, Ben has received too many awards to, to list. Some highlights include the Patrick Fellowship, the Presidential of the Career Award. And most recently, uh, Ben was um, elected a fellow of the American Physical Society. So today we have the pleasure of hearing about some fun Ben's been having in his quantum toy chest. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to your talk then. That's a great title, Quantum Toy Chest. I'll, I'll use that. I'll cite you on the bottom. I'm going to just pop out of here because I wore my Caltech shoes. <laughs> so I used to sit right back there uh, in innumerable. Yes, that was my spot. Uh, it's just a pleasure to be back in this room uh, facing you all rather than this way. I remember sitting here on the first day, my first year of graduate school, um, when they're talking about the uh, the exams, the placement exams. I was quick, you know, so scared. <laughs> um, and uh, wow, it's been a long road and it's really great to come back and say hi to all of you. So uh, let me um, tell you about some of the work that I've been doing. Maybe this is the right vantage point. Okay. Um, some of the work that I've been doing uh, in my laboratory. This is one of my three experiments at Stanford um, where we've been playing with quantum toys. Okay, so which toys? Uh, we've been playing with Newton's cradles, we've been playing with Archimedes screws, quantum versions of those. Um, and the people who, and what we've been playing with is this uh, star of the show over here, uh, which is Dispersion. And I think because of chat. Oh, that's for me. Could you go to more? Uh huh. Yes, you are correct. Um, let me just do that. Hide, hide, pan, hide floating media. There we go. Perfect. Okay, good. Let me go back on track. So, um, excellent. Uh, yeah, so the star of the show is dysprosium. It's the most magnetic element. Uh, this is a glowing uh, gas of it coming out of an oven right here. It's a, a beautiful blue. Um, and these are the other stars of the show. Um, and these are all the people in my group, but these are the four people who have been working on this particular experiment, especially uh, Kuan Yu Li, Mo Kao, Kuan Yin Yang, and uh, Kuan Yin Lin. Um, and this is uh, an older picture uh, of us uh, maybe nine months ago. So, um, and I'm very fortunate to have several theory collaborators on this specific project, um, uh, most of which uh, are at Penn State, uh, starting with Paul Christian, who's now moving to Princeton, um, Marcus Regal and his uh, student, now postdoc, Eugene Chang. Okay, so why am I doing this? What, what is the, uh, the, the toy chest all about? It's not working. Let's see here. Just hit the mouse button. Oh, man, you know this. Okay, um, okay so why are we doing this? Um, it's a study quantum thermalization. Okay, that's, that's the scientific goal. And these are uh, not the excuse to play with these kinds of systems. Um, so let's begin and talk about uh, thermalization. 
So uh, there's these three concepts that are very related, uh, integrability, chaos, and thermalization. And uh, I want to talk about their relationship to one another, what they are, the relationship, and then how that relates to quantum physics and what experiments might be needed in order to learn more about this. So uh, integrability. Uh, integrability is the property of a system um, in which, uh, which has an extensive number of conserved quantities. So you can literally integrate it the equations of motion out to long times and predicts the trajectories of the particles in the system. So an illustration of that would be, say, a circular billiard where you launch a ball and it creates this very regular orbit. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, some nice physical toy realization of that is new too. So if you ignore friction, um, this thing will just go on forever and execute these kinds of orbitals in phase, you know, plot the momentum and the trajectory of momentum and position, you'll see some regular orbits. Um, now there's many things that can break integrability. It's a fine-tuned property. It's not something you just get for free. You have to be very careful of how you engineer it. So some of the things that can break integrability are just simply changing the boundary conditions. So if you take the circular billiard and you uh, uh, um, put two flat kind of uh, bound, uh, boundaries between the, uh, the hemicircles on either side, extend it like this, we immediately get something that is chaotic. The trajectories don't repeat themselves and are exponentially sensitive to initial conditions. And of course, you can play with something that is kind of intermediate, which is the elliptical barrier failure, but you have to be careful in how you design it, because if you stretch it just a little too much, it becomes chaotic. And that's a not a very fun pool table. Um, so that's one thing that can happen. Um, dimensionality can also break integrability. So uh, if you can find particles in 1D, you get integrability for free in general, not always, but in general. Um, and that arises for the following reason. If you have two um, particles and they collide, uh, then there's only you know, one thing that can happen after the collision. They just go back the opposite ways um, with either exchanging, you know, with the momentums basically not changing uh, from the initial uh, state, right? So if you have a distribution of momenta, the mapping of that distribution from uh, pre before a collision to after a collision doesn't change. It doesn't randomize, it doesn't uh, redistribute in any non trivial way. There's no way to take something that looks out of equilibrium and bring it to like a Gaussian, which would denote some equilibrium distribution, okay? It just maps onto itself. Um, however, if you just go to 2D and certainly in 3D, then because you can have glancing collisions now with momenta that are kind of, you know, not always uh, 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 counter propagating, then the product that comes out doesn't have to be very related to the product that comes in. Obviously, you have to conserve energy momentum, but you can get um, basically a distribution of from in to out that looks very, very different. And it turns out that after three collisions in a gas, of, these, of, of particles like this, the momentum is, is randomized, okay? So two and three dimensions allow you to randomize very, very efficiently, all right? So that's because of chaos. And more generally, chaos emerges smoothly. And this is the famous KAM theorem from the 1950s, um, which stated um, in very hand wavy sense of if there are experts in the audience, uh, uh, you know, great. But uh, I'm just gonna give you some hand wavy explanation. Um, if you take some phase space diagram, which is again, the diagram of a trajectory and momentum versus position uh, for a degree for these two degrees of freedom, um, then uh, you can go from something that is completely integrable where you have these nice periodic orbits um, to something that is chaotic and uh, where you just have like kind of filling of the entire uh, uh, momentum and position uh, space. Uh, via something that smoothly transitions. So if you increase some perturbation that breaks integrability, generally speaking, you get some sort of smooth uh, transition where uh, there are islands of regular behavior that persists in some ever-growing sea of chaos, okay? Um, and so uh, an example of that, that allows us to be here, is the, is the fact that the uh, solar system, despite that gravity is a chaotic perturbation. It's a long range one over our interaction that couples every body to every other body um, that induces chaos, but it's not strong enough to put us into this regime, allows us to, to maintain ourselves within these islands. 
and that's why we're here. Okay, um, uh, and so um, and so the upshot of all this and, and this unification of these ideas comes about by thinking in, in this context of, of say milk going into coffee. Chaos is what underpins thermalization because chaos is the thing that allows two fluids to efficiently mix. Okay, allows um, the system to very efficiently explore all the phase space to give you equal probability for all the allowed microcanonical states, and that's what ergodicity means. Okay, so when you learn about ergodicity, it's usually just invoked, but mechanistically from Newton's, uh, Newton's mechanics, it comes from chaos, and that's what gives you the mud that we all create. Okay. All right, so, um, but this, this ability to break integrability and induce chaos is an interesting tool. It's a tool that allows you to kind of go from something that you might know to something that you don't know, and the process for how that happens can fingerprint various dynamics uh, and thermalization mechanisms of the uh, system uh, being studied. So, um, so another, so uh, I want to tell you another way to break integrability, and this is a perturbation that relies on long-range forces, because I'm going to use this in order to explore integra integration, uh, integrability breaking in the quantum setting. So let me first explain the classical setting. If I have a long-range force, like um, you know, here the, 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 the balls are contact interacting. They actually have to touch each other to affect um, each other. So that's what gives you this uh, nice integrable. But if you make the balls magnetic, okay, um, then you see, you get something that looks black, right? This doesn't look anything like this nice periodic motion. Um, if you stare at it long enough, and I have <laughs> many YouTube videos, um, it, you can convince yourself that there's no pattern. It's really chaotic. So this is already a chaotic system. So wouldn't it be neat to have some controller that allows you to crank up the amount of magnetization on these balls so that you can dial in and explore that nice KAM transition, okay? And actually, I, I did this with my son at home. We actually would glue uh, magnets of ever stronger, uh, you know, magnetization and saw, you know, how the dynamics play out, how long it took to, to kind of uh, get this behavior. So it's a fun thing that you can do at home if you like. Um, so, but what I want to do here is to um, explore how the long range force um, can break into ability in a quantum system, because in quantum many body systems, we don't know how that works, okay? We don't, in general, know how quantum many body systems thermalize. Okay, we know it if you touch the system to a bath, that's in textbooks, but if it's isolated, um, there's only a few cases where we, we really understand this. It's not something that we understand generally, okay? So that's, uh, that's what we'd like to explore. And in order to do that, uh, we need to have a quantum many body integral system to start playing with and poking and perturbing. Okay? So um, a really good place to start is uh, 1D gas. You kind of get integrability for free in a 1D gas. Um, so uh, let's, let's consider the 1D Bose gas. And this is described by this famous model from Lee Vinegar. Um, which has two terms. It has a kinetic energy term and it has an interaction term that's approximated as a, a delta function or a contact interaction between the particles. And it turns out that atoms, um, ultra cold atoms, actually realize this to a very high degree. So that's, that's relevant and nice. And the coupling strength is this G1D parameter. Now, unfortunately, you know that I'm talking, it's covering up something. So uh, let's see, G1D here. Is proportional to a 3d um let's see if i can move that uh give me a, a moment oh i don't even know where my cursor is anymore okay it's too much okay i'm not gonna deal with it um so uh believe me uh when i say that uh, under here there's a subscript that is uh, 3d so g1d is proportional to what's called a scattering length which is called a 3d uh the physical interpretation of that is it's kind of like you know where the two particles touch all right, and if you square it, multiply it by pi, that gives you the cross section or the kind of the probability for, for colliding. All right, that's that's what this parameter is physically. So if you take the ratio of this coupling constant divided by the density times you know uh, mass over h plus squared, you get what's called the lead linear parameter or gamma, and this kind of gives you a way to, to characterize the various states that are exhibited by this uh, lead linear model. So um, if 
this parameter is much less than one, which means at high density or low coupling, then um, you get something that's somewhat boring. It's, it's like a Bose-Einstein condensate, not exactly. It doesn't have a home range order, but it sort of looks like that, where the wave functions for the particles kind of overlap over so. All right. Um, and notice that that happens at uh, large density. So quantum physics is weird in 1D, all right? Um, What's neat though is that this parameter G1D can be tuned. Its strength can be tuned because it's proportional to this physical thing A3D, and A3D can be tuned uh, using something called a Feshbach resonance. So never mind exactly what that is. It's a it's a phenomenon where if you apply a magnetic field in this context, you can change the phase shift of a two-particle collision. So if you studied in undergrad or graduate quantum. The, all that matters for two-particle quantum collisions is the outgoing phase shift to tell you the, the probability or the cross-section of that collision. And that's all that A3D is. It's just a, it's a way to convert phase shift to a scattering or to a cross-section. And so by changing the magnetic field, you can change this parameter all the way from zero to infinity, it turns out, okay? That's something that is unique to atomic systems that would be hard to do in the solid state. So if you crank up G1D by using a magnetic field, then, um, then what happens is that you get a new state um, that has a very different character. In fact, you know, if you look at kind of like the two body wave functions, like they don't overlap anymore. They want to avoid each other to minimize this, this high energy penalty here. Okay, and so it ends up looking like something like uh, an ideal Fermi gas, even though it's made out of bosons. And that's a, a phenomenon called Fermionization. It's bizarre, folks, right? Like they're bosons, but they look and behave like fermions, at least in position. Okay. Um, and that's a manifestation of the fact that in one dimension, there's no such thing as exchange without collision. So when you talk about exchange statistics, well, it goes out the window. You don't have any way to exchange without them first colliding. Okay. So bosons and fermions, that concept gets mixed up in one dimension. Um, and then, you know, if you want to be a little bit more specific, if you write down the wave functions, particle uh, wave functions for bosons, um, they, it's identical to the fermions uh, in position space up to an absolute value. So when you get to this regime where gamma is very large or infinite, you uh, realize what's called the tongue pure dough gas, I call it TG gas for short, um, which is identical in some, but not all properties, but in, in some uh, respects to an ideal fermion gas. Okay. So that, that's really kind of a duality that's quite fascinating. So what we like to do is make a Newton's cradle, all right? Um, and we can do that in one dimension with atoms. Uh, and uh, since the atoms can pass through each other and are coherent and so forth, uh, it's a quantum Newton's cradle. And this was first done by David Weiss uh, almost 15, well, 15 years ago. Um, and the way that you can do this, if he does with rubidium, um, is that you can make a two-dimensional optical lattice, which makes an array of tubes like so. Um, there can be several hundred or a thousand tubes all in parallel, so you make many new cradles. I mean, that's kind of mind uh, numbing to think about all these oscillating at the same time. Thousands of new cradles would probably go crazy, but um, that's what happens at a microscopic uh, level. Um, and then you can kick it with a blast of light, set it in motion, and the packets can split and come together and split in a coherent way, so these are wave packets. And then you can image the momentum, the position or the momentum, we, we prefer the momentum. And you can see these uh, packets of atom momentum, moment space colliding, just like you would imagine for a harmonic oscillator. It's harmonic because in this direction, the envelope of the laser beams is a Gaussian. So it's roughly a harmonic here. And so what was neat about this result is that if you look at this momentum distribution as a function of time, it doesn't form a Gaussian very quickly, okay? Momentum distribution that's thermalized should look like a Gaussian, Maxwell, not Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, um, but it actually forms some flat top distribution and holds that for a very, very long time. So, uh, uh, so what this uh, experiment showed was that you can get a system that's near. Why is it near? Well, it's not exact. If you wait a very long time, the system is not uh, going to stay in this um, deface flat top distribution. It's going to look like a Gaussian. They weren't able to see it in this project, but that's what happened. Okay, or it gets lost, or you know the trap is not perfectly um, harmonic, uh, so it's it's not an integral system even at the level of the Hamiltonian, but it's very near, it lasts longer than you would expect. Okay, so that's exciting. So I'd like to take that nice result and replace the rubidium atoms with dysprosium atoms. 
Why? Because dysprosium is the most magnetic element. It has 10 more magnetons, a magnetic moment. That's 10 times larger than rubidium. So when you square that to get the dipole dipole interaction, it's 100 times more magnetic than collisions with rubidium. Factor of 100 is really important. That means that if we're going to see some sort of like breakdown of integrability and like a more rapid thermalization, then uh, we have 100 times uh, more likely to do that because this is much stronger. Okay. Um, so where is it? It's one of these that you tend to ignore unless you know you realize that these are everywhere in this rare earth because that's how you get the energy efficient batteries. Um, use some of these niobium and stuff like that. Uh, uh, so dysprosium is here. That's what it looks like. Uh, this is a picture of one of my the experiment that does this in my laboratory. It's a laser light show. Um, and uh, we, you know, this is a very complicated atom, but we figured out uh, many years ago, 10 years, more than 10 years ago now, um, how to laser cool and trap it. So we made the first uh, Bose Einstein condensates of it, and you can just switch to a different isotope and make degenerate Fermi gases with it. So it's a nice resource that we've used for many different experiments by now. Uh, it's fun. All right, so how can you tune this now? I told you what you'd like to do, like I did with my son, is to change the magnetization of each uh, ball um, and get closer and closer to a chaotic system and see how that trends as a way to fingerprint the way that quantum many body systems are models. So what's the knob, continuous knob that we can do? Uh, we can change the dipole angle with respect to the 1D axis. So if you apply a magnetic field, polarizing magnetic field, which you can do with two coils in the z-axis and the x-axis with different ratios of current, um, then you can uh, change the angle of these dipoles with respect to the one-dimensional axis like so, and then you can image along this direction and see what's going on with the density or momentum of those, those atoms. Uh, so if we change this angle, uh, then you uh, can use the fact that the dipole-dipole interaction uh, scales as one minus three cosine squared theta to realize either attractive interactions at zero degrees, uh, repulsive at 90 degrees, when somewhere in the middle has to go to zero, so that ends up being 55 degrees. 54.7 degrees, okay? So this is our, our tuning knob. So let's see how the magnetic quantum Newton's cradle uh, behaves. Uh, if you uh, kind of set in motion, but uh, don't trap it in 1D yet, but uh, trap it just in, in 3D. And with 3D, you break into your goalie, as we talked about in the beginning. Um, and you see that the thermalization time scale, is pretty rapid. It's about 100 uh, milliseconds, which is about 10 uh, periods of the oscillation. So you see, the two initial peaks coalesce into one galaxy. However, if you uh, trap it in one dimension and just say you fix it at 35 degrees for now, um, you see, wow, like much, much longer um, uh, thermalization rate. Like it takes all the way to about two and a half seconds. Now, folks, that's a macroscopic time scale for this microscopic quantum antibody system. That's like a thousand one, a thousand two, a thousand three. Like I can count that. You can hear me do that where the system, this quantum system, is, is evading thermalization. That's, that's pretty impressive. And that has to do with the fact that it's, it's uh, proximal to this integrable point at this angle. So, what we like to do is analyze this. You know, we're physicists, that's what we do. And so, you can, you can, you can analyze these curves and you can fit this to you know, how, how rapidly it becomes a galaxy. And I won't go into the details, but um, you can plot. Uh, some proxy a thermalization rate as a function of angle, having done that analysis. And, uh, and this is what you get. So uh, you get the, the thermalization rate as a function of angle, uh, 35 degrees is right here. It turns out that you get something that increases as you get to stronger and stronger repulsion. Um, never mind exactly why this changes by a factor of, of 10 in this particular way. Um, you can look at this article to find out or you talk to me later. But the point that I want to highlight is that we can understand this, okay? Now that we have this data, it's the first kind of data ever for a strongly correlated system, we can now ask ourselves, can we understand it, okay? And at first blush, we thought there was no way to do this. It's a strongly interacting system, strongly correlated, forget about it. We're averaging over a thousand tubes at once. Like, there's no way to understand it. But it turned out that we were able to cook up a very simple model. Um, that with no free parameters gave us a straight curve with parameters and measured parameter uncertainty of this uh, blue band here that um, corresponds fairly well to our data. So what is that model? Um, it looks like this. Um, you have uh, the first term, which is gamma squared, which changes as a function of angle, actually. 
because that changes the contact interaction because there's a, a little bit of the dipole interaction that affects the contact interaction. Uh, so if you account for that, um, it basically tells you the probability of two atoms being near each other to have a contact interaction. And then you multiply it by Fermi's golden rule uh, for, um, for the kind of decay that would happen uh, from a long range dipolar interaction of these two particles with some remote particle, okay, via the long range dipole dipole. This is the dipolar interaction strength squared divided by the collision energy. So, what this is really telling you is that you have a way to break integrability. The thing that breaks integrability, and we didn't know this ahead of time, is this particular three body interaction, which involves two particles that are short range interacting with one long range particle. And so when these uh, three particles come together and they go away in this collision process, you lose some sort of uh, understanding of, the, of which particle interacts with, with, with the other ones because these two are so close, you don't know is it this particle that interacts with this one or this particle that interacts with, with that one. And that subtle kind of loss of uh, information um, is enough to break integrability. For the experts in the audience, it uh, violates beta onsets uh, for this model. Okay, and so, you, so, so that's why this, uh, this is the thing that breaks, that's the, the Feynman uh, you know, diagram you have the rails here. Um, that this is the vertex that breaks integrability. All right, so that's really neat. Nobody knew that before this experiment. Um, oh, what just happened? Okay, all right, good. Yeah, so that's what the Newton's cradle, so that's our first toy. And that's what the Newton's cradle uh, taught us about, which is you can cook up a very simple expression and explain, uh, what's going on with a strongly interacting system. Um, now I want to transition to the second part of my talk, uh, which is the Archimedes screw part, the other toy. Um, and this will show us a way in which we can uh, generate states that evade thermalization. So we sh showed how we can uh, induce thermalization. Now let's try to evade thermalization in a quantum state. Uh, and what we'll do in, in order to do this is we'll create a new type of version of an Archimedes screw uh, you know, which is this object that, you know, you, you twist something uh, back to itself and you can pump in one direction um, something like water uh, against gravity. Um, and, and this new method uh, will actually enable us to pump the system to a very high energy state that avoids thermalization. What's different than this, which is in space, is uh, a pumping energy. So let me just be a little bit more concrete about that. The Archimedes screw, um, when you turn some phase, uh, some, some phase variable um, back to itself from zero uh, to two pi, uh, the system comes back to itself, but something uh, coupled to the system does not come back to itself, actually gets pumped uh, in position uh, to a different state. Okay? It, it kind of has this interesting property, uh, topological property of that nature. So this is not just a classical thing, uh, Thales and others. I've come up with quantum versions of this, like the charge pump. Um, so there's been many demonstrations of that. This is one in, in a, an AMO system with an optical lattice that's bichromatic. You change the phase between the bichromatic uh, lattices, so you can uh, move a wave packet from site to site, like an inchworm, whereas in classical, it'll just kind of go up and down. So there's many versions of this, of course. Uh, what we're talking about is pumping in energy. And that's something that I don't know if it actually has been demonstrated before our work. Uh, I don't want to claim precedence, but like I'm not really aware of other examples. I don't know if someone told me that there are that I can cite. Uh, but let me explain what it means. Um, so if you go back to this lead Linegar model, um, you'll notice again, I was talking about this coupling parameter, which is a function of a magnetic field. And it turns out, you know, this has a symmetry property where if I change the magnetic field, I can take this, this, coup this coupling strength from zero to positive infinity and then directly to negative infinity and then back to zero again and repeat the cycle over and over again. And every time I come back, this is called a confinement. This is where the Feshbach resonance is or confinement induced resonance. Uh, so every time I come back, the Hamiltonian becomes exactly the same. But as I'll show, the eigenstates actually get pumped to a higher energy. So every time I come back to itself, Hamiltonian is the same, but eigenstates go up in energy. Right. Um, this has been well known for, you know, you can cook this up with like a particle in the well, actually, a single particle. Um, for this particular model, uh, actually, after we did this, we discovered this paper. So it had been known, we didn't know about it, but 
2013, people recognize that this model has this uh, property, which is called a quantum holonym. It's uh, kind of like a, an analog of parallel transport on a, on a screen. Um, so the magic of this happens at this point here, when you go plus infinity to minus infinity, there's a discontinuity. Um, it's a strange type of quench, and that's idiomatic, in that as you go from here to here, um, even though the interaction parameter um, jumps dramatically, um, the, the wave function doesn't change uh, as you go from here to here, okay? It's, the wave function is continuous. What does change is that you introduce an infinite number of bound states when you're on the attractive side, okay? These are like clusters or whatever. So you go from here, you're in the ground state, you go to here, you're in a very excited state. But everything else is continuous, and so it's adiabatic. So physically, we can do this by using these um, Feshbach residences, um, where uh, as a function of magnetic field, your atom may just happen to give you a resonance at a particular field, which you can exploit to change G1D from something you know, nominal to something infinite. And then you jump to the attractive regime where it's negative, attractive, and it'll cross zero again as it goes to another resonance, which you know may be hundreds of gauss away, but in that, and actually the explosion it could be as close as a few milligauss or tens or hundreds of milligauss. So it's very convenient explosion. And that's why this is a good atom to use for that. You have many of these resonances. So you can just keep going and going. Every time you get one of these resonances, you, you create a cycle. So um, this is one ingredient you need. Uh, but there's a second ingredient you need in order to do this, and that's when you get to this, um, when you get to this attractive part, you have to make sure that the gas doesn't collapse on itself to all of those bound states at lower energy. If it were a particular, if it were a perfectly integrable system, where um, you know uh, everything, every state that you prepared it initially is an eigenstate, then there would be no matrix element for it to couple to these bound states, they would never collapse. But of course, nothing's perfect. And in particular, in our laboratory, we create these one-dimensional gases with lasers. It's not perfectly harmonic, even if it were, it still break, that breaks integrability. The trap itself, the fact it's not an ideal one-dimensional system, breaks integrability at a very low level. And that's uh, why everyone else who's tried to do this, actually, they didn't know that they're making a, uh, a screw or this holonomy, but every time they tried to just make a state over here in one dimensional system, uh, by the time they went from negative infinity to something uh, large but finite, um, the system just collapsed, formed clusters like kind of molecules. And those molecules weren't held by the, the optical lattice and just fell out of the crack. Okay, so the thing just dies. And you can't complete a whole cycle, it just dies right there. So, um, so we, we, I'm going to tell you about how we can make this thing stable by using these magnetic moments, okay? And together, these two things create a new type of state called a quantum anybody square state. I imagine other people have stood right here and talked to you about it. It's been a very popular and hot topic over the last um, five, 10 years. Um, we're going to talk about the second version of this discovered um, in this kind of system and what it means. So let's revisit the states of a uh, one-dimensional Bose gas. So as we scan here, we have a crossover diagram where you go from something that's weakly interacting to something that looks like a quasi BC to this tongue Girardot gas at plus infinity uh, G1D. And then boom, you go to this uh, new state, which is uh, now an excited state uh, that has kind of a very similar wave function. It's called a super TG gas. It's very creative terminology, I grant you. Um, but then that super tungsten gas eventually becomes more and more weakly attractive um, until it hits uh, zero interaction. Then you get an ideal Bose gas again, and then you just repeat the cycle. Okay. Um, so what happens between here and here is very interesting. You get this tungsten gas, which I showed you earlier, and then um, immediately after the, this the switch to here, you get the same thing. But if you go a little bit after that, what happens is that you start to develop many many nodes a nose for each bound state that comes in. And this nose kind of separate the larger probability distributions for the two particles. So you get kind of a length here. It's called A1D. You get a length of separation of an exclusion zone between the two particles. And if you kind of squint, this looks like the model, like it's a very standard uh, uh, condensed matter classical physics uh, model for a gas of 1D hard rods in a box, okay? Where the length of the rod is equal to this exclusion zone 
which ends up being inversely proportional to A3D. Okay, so there's some you know atomic reason for this. Um, so you just kind of like make these hard and hard rods, which gives you a, a more and more correlated system. And it's no surprise that the system collapses in general because if you have a, a box of a finite length and you have rods inside of it that can only be end to end, and you get make them longer, eventually uh, the sum of, of those lengths becomes longer than the box, and that's really uncomfortable. And they kink. When they kink, the model you know just dies, right? The system um, is unstable, all right? So this is why you get this instability here. Uh, that's not why, but it's an illustration of it. So um, what we want to do is see what happens in our dysprosium gas. And so we have to have a way to know where we are on this, on this crossover diagram. And so a good way to do that is to measure um, the ratio of two trap oscillation frequencies, which tells you something about the stiffness of the gas. So if you uh, kick it uh, and measure its sloshing, and then uh, kick it uh, a little bit more gently and measure its breathing, and you take the ratio of those two frequencies, you cancel out everything that depends non-universally on the trap, and you get something that depends only on the interactions, which then tell you about this system. And so uh, what you get by taking the ratio squared, which is called R traditionally, you get the stiffness, or um, uh, otherwise known as the inverse compressibility of the system. Okay. And so what's known uh, is that for an ideal Bose gas, this ratio is four. For a quasi-BDC, it's less stiff um, because the particles are overlapping. Uh, that you get something that's three. Uh, for Tangshiro gas, it's four, and there's no coincidence here. Tangshiro gas is an ideal Fermi gas, which has the same stiffness as an ideal Bose gas. Okay, that's that connection. Um, but then when you get to the super tungs gas, it become, the stiffness becomes greater than four, meaning that you have more and more correlations between the particles um, or exclusion, it becomes much more stiff. Okay, so you get something that uh, goes over four, and that's the smoking gun. So let's look at the state stability of this superconscious mass as a function of angle. So we're, we're going to go, uh, we're going to prepare the system by going through this first resonance and prepare it just inside the state here uh, in this region here. Okay. And this is what we get for 55 degrees. Okay. So 55 degrees, if you recall, that's zero intertube uh, interaction, uh, intratube interaction, there's no bipolar interaction. Uh, and what you get is, uh, you know, here's the uh, stiffness as a function of a uh, parameter. It's kind of a funky parameter. It's called A squared. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, written in this way uh, under the local density approximation to account for the finite size of the system. So A parallel is just the length of the, the tube, okay, that you can find in. So it's normalized by that times the number of particles. So it gives you some sense of the, the, the interactions in the uh, context of a finite size system. So um, because it's, uh, it's a little bit weird, um, this side is no interactions. Uh, this side is infinite negative interactions, okay? So it's a little bit backwards. So if you don't mind, you can flip that in your head. All right, so what you see is that when you have this um, infinitely uh, attractive super tungs gas, we indeed see that the stiffness is greater than four. It's about 4.4 four uh, 4 .4 or so. So, okay, great. We successfully made the superconscious gas. Uh, but then, as I uh, told you, um, as you decrease the uh, attractive interactions, which increases the length of these rods in a kind of, you know, uh, classical picture, um, and you go into this uh, re regime here, the system becomes less stiff and then nosedives towards zero stiffness. And something zero, zero stiffness, um, that just means that it's collapsed into a wall, right? If something has no stiffness, that's, that's a, that instability, all right? So, um, so this does, you know, kind of what people had known in the past. It collapses into what's known as cluster states, where there's like, you know, in, in the thermal dynamic limit, there's an infinite number of these states of various uh, combinations of bound states like so, which becomes a stuck blob. And this we can't trap, it falls out of our system, all right? Um, this uh, curve here is just a Monte Carlo calculation. It doesn't get this crossover just right, but that's just kind of like non-universal physics right here. But it basically tells you the same thing should happen. And indeed, if you do this with some non-dipolar atom, which is cesium, which is very weakly magnetic, um, you get something similar. It does something exactly like this. And that was seen by uh, Christoph Nagel's group um, many years ago. So, um, so why did it collapse? Uh, again, you, you get this kind of um, imperfect confinement that breaks integrability, and that leads to non-zero matrix elements that coupled to these cluster states. Um, so, 
And you might be wondering, okay, well, Ben, you just told me in the first half of this talk that in the Newton's cradle, adding dipolar interactions, especially ones that are at 90 degrees, break integrability even more. They make the system thermalize even more. Of course, thermalization is akin to coupling to these cluster states, okay, which are the majority states. And, you know, that's what ergodicity needs in the system. Um, so if you change this angle here, you're likely to do something worse, okay? You're likely to make this thing collapse even worse, okay? So, um, so let's try to see what happens. Um, so let's go to zero degrees. So zero degrees, everything is, is attractive. And indeed, you know, the collapse uh, points here happens earlier in interaction structure, okay? That makes intuitive sense. It doubly makes intuitive sense because attractive interactions just mean that the uh, particles want to bind together even more, right? So no mystery there. So my intuition in doing this experiment when I was talking to my students, I was like, okay, well, let's just try it out, right? Let's just try to go to 90 degrees. And what we might see, and it'd be really interesting, is that at 90 degrees, this point here shifts a little bit to stronger, uh, to, to a weaker coupling. Like it lasts a little bit longer after the crunch. And any little bit, like even 10%, would be really fascinating. We can try to study this. That was my expectation. This is reality. Whoa. The repulsive dipolar interaction completely stabilized the, tongue, the uh, super tongue's gas. So no matter how far away we went from the quench, no matter how far, how much we uh, decreased the contact interaction towards zero, the system never collapsed. You notice that the scale is different. It never actually went below four, okay? So what happens is that it starts at 4.4, which is kind of the same, all right? That's kind of this universal point where the dipolar interaction should matter, because this is infinite. This is the infinite term in the Hamiltonian. It starts out sort of the same, then it goes up, but doesn't come back down immediately. It stays up, stays up, stays up, and then only when, where this dashed line is, where the strength of the dipolar interaction becomes somewhat equivalent to the strength of the contact interaction, does it come down? But it doesn't like collapse, it doesn't go to zero stiffness, it just stays constant there and it becomes weakly interacting. That's a surprise, folks. Nobody ordered that, okay? This is weird. So why does this happen? And uh, I mean, you know, the beta ansatz calculation sort of gets this trend uh, qualitatively, not exactly. Um, it seems like it's acting like an internal system. Even though we, by hand, introduced another integrability breaking term. Somehow those two terms conspire to cancel each other out in terms of stability. Why did that happen? That has to happen with some sort of very subtle correlation because the temperature of the gas is actually larger you know, or similar energy scale to this repulsive energy. And there's just no way that this repulsion is uh, accounting for all of that. So we don't really know why. This happens, and that's you know, just want very soon now. It's uh, please think about this and come talk to me. Um, it's an open problem, but what I do know is that it enables a topological pump because you can go all the way from infinity back to zero, and you hopefully can do it again. So let's do it again. All right, so let's cycle again and again, and we can do that because uh, we don't just have one flashback resonance, but we have more. So let's start over here and measure energy density. So we measure, we, we measure the energy of the system, and we're going to plot it on this, this graph here, which is kinetic energy over here, suitably normalized, like in terms of something that's sort of like a Fermi energy, um, uh, as a function of uh, this x-axis, which is the inverse of what I just showed you, A squared. I'm very sorry, that's just how the community does it. Um, now the left is more sensibly zero interactions. The right is, is more sensibly infinite interactions. This is gamma. And what we see is that as we go from zero to positive infinity, this is all the ground state here, we get these black points, which uh, are very close to this line here. Uh, that line uh, is a beta ansatz calculation. Um, and then we go through this quench point here. Okay, so now we're in the attractive branch. So that are these uh, squares, these blue squares. So we backtrack back up this way, increasing the energy as we go up this way. The energy is increasing because we're winding this the larger, uh, to, to winding this further and further, increasing the phase shift of the collisions <laughs> until we get um, four times uh, the Fermi energy of this uh, tungsten gas over here. 
This thing is the uh, this thing is the ideal Bose gas, but a very excited Bose gas. Um, now we do it again. Okay, so now we go back onto a repulsive branch, and we do this again. It gets a little bit more scattered, but bear with me. Uh, we do it again. Okay, so we pass through this uh, this point here. We cycle through this thing twice, and we can go all the way up where we pump the system sixteen times the the effective Fermi energy of this system. Okay. Um, and wow, that's that's really wild that we can do this without any sort of collapse. This, you know, if you can squint a little bit and be generous to me, this is kind of like an Archimedes screw. This is an energy space, okay? This is in position space, it's not the same thing, but it's a topological pump nonetheless. It uses this quantum polynomial that happens every time you go from positive infinity to negative infinity at these points. And what's just totally bizarre is that despite the fact that you've added to this lieb Linegar model, a um, a uh, integrability breaking term associated with the trap and an integrability breaking term associated with the dipole dipole interaction energy. Somehow those two things, when you put them together, uh, conspire to enable the system to behave very close to the ideal toy model of the lead Linegar model, whose solutions using beta ansatz are these uh, solid and dashed lines. Like, okay, our experimental scatter is. Not insignificant, but it kind of follows it, right? And that's just totally unexpected, okay? Like, this is not something that anybody thought of a priority. You really had to do the experiment to, to actually find this. Okay, so let me just add one more step and then I'll conclude. So you might ask yourself, what are these states here? We know what these states are. These are non-interacting gases of various excitation energies. Those are zero contact interaction. No, there's slightly that for um, these are uh, unitary gases where the interactions are, are divergent, which means that particle collisions happen as often as safe space allows. So that's called a unitary gas. Um, and these are uh, effectively integrable systems because uh, none of the perturbations matter. So this, this is kind of trivial over here. This is certainly trivial because it's not interacting. This intermediate coupling regime is very non trivial. These are strongly correlated gases that um, are carefully prepared in these excited states, and they, they're pre-thermal. They actually don't um, decay immediately. Um, and these are some things that we call quantum antibody scars. All right, so what are quantum antibody scar states? This is the formal definition. Um, they're states that evade thermalization. They're delicate, carefully prepared, atypical, strongly interacting states that are non integral so they're non-trivial, and they avoid thermalization. So why do they get this name? Uh, well, in the 80s, people were fascinated with looking at uh, quantum analogs of classically chaotic systems like the billiard I was telling you about. If you launch a wave packet into uh, this, uh, this extended billiard, um, which is chaotic classically, you'll see that uh, mysteriously, uh, there's probability uh, amplitude that gets concentrated along very uh, uh, particular trajectories. Okay, so here's one. Where you have a chevron trajectory, and here's another one where you have this uh, figure of eight. These are classically uh, stable trajectories, but have you know zero measure in phase space. Like they're they're unstable. If you make a slight perturbation to this, it won't come back to itself. So this is known in classical systems that you have a tiny, tiny infinitesimal subset of trajectories that actually do repeat themselves, even though the system is chaotic. And uh, these are termed scars because they leave this probability. Um, Distribution that's uh, kind of, it's, uh, you know, that remembers the fact that it has these uh, classically stable or orbits. Okay. Uh, so that's a scar. It's like, you know, you wound yourself, you get a scar, that's a memory of something that happened in the past. So that's why it's scar. So this is a one body effect. And, you know, since the 80s, people used about the fact of, you know, what happens if you have more than one billiard in here, like that two or three or 10 to the 23. The fact that you have these multiple collisions in two dimensions ruin these very special states. Do they still exist? And nobody knew actually. Um, but uh, one of these was actually found uh, experimentally uh, just a few years ago uh, in the Harvard group uh, where they made a tweezer array of Rydberg atoms, initialized them in this up down, up down anti ferromagnetic pattern, and saw that this pattern is stable for many um, or much longer than. Uh, just random patterns uh, drawn from Gibbs, Gibbs distribution. So this was, you know, a very unusual uh, initial state, just like these are uh, unusual initial states. 
It happens a lot, lasts a lot longer than the generic state. And since this is interacting through uh, Rydberg um, interactions, uh, this was deemed to the first experimental version of a quantum many body dispersed state. So that's really neat. Uh, this is a lattice system. What we did was create the very second uh, version of this, and it's actually in a continuum. So I don't think anybody used about, which I, I don't, I'm not aware of anybody using about uh, star states in the continuum. We just happened to discover it experimentally. And that's what, what these states are up here. Okay. Um, and I can prove we, we've actually studied the lifetime and showed that it lasts abnormally long, et cetera, et cetera. That's in, in this uh, paper here that you can, you can uh, look at or, or you can talk to me about it later. Um, but that's exciting. And it begs the question, you know, what are these things, right? What are, what's the wave function of these things? Like I can see what this thing is, but like, what are these? Um, so how do we learn more about them? Um, so the one thing that you can do to learn more about them is measure a very weird property. This is my last slide. Um, called a, uh, a rapidity. Okay, so what is a rapidity? Uh, they are the conserved quantities of strongly inter interacting integral systems. So they are the quantum numbers. If you diagonalize the system, they're the quantum numbers, okay? Um, and they relate to the momenta of the quasi particles of the star uh, state. So each atom is a bare particle, but it's dressed by its interactions with all the others that forms a quasi particle when it's strongly interacting correlated, the momentum of that quasi-particle uh, is distinct from the momentum of the bare particles. Um, and, uh, and for example, to illustrate that, the rapidities of the tungsten O gas are the same as the ideal Fermi gas, but their bare particle momenta are very different. One looks like a Bose distribution, one looks like a Fermi distribution. Okay? These are not the same things. Quasi-particles are their own piece, and they're the things that you can calculate because they're the things that diagonalize the um, but it's really hard to measure this experimentally because we don't have like a, a camera that just goes in and says, hey, I want to measure the quasi particle. We just measure the particles. Photons or some probe measures the particle, not the quasi particles. So it's really hard to actually uh, image those. Uh, but now it's possible because some very clever people figured out a way to do this. Some theorists uh, many years ago, and recently David Weiss uh, had a really nice experiment uh, demonstrating it in a ground state uh, uh, 1D gas. So we use that method. I'm not going to tell you about it uh, unless you ask me afterwards. Um, but it's pretty clever. Um, and we use this method first to benchmark that with dysprosium, with dipoles, um, you can do the same thing. And we benchmark against quantum Monte Carlo um, to show that you get exactly what you should, should expect. Um, and so here's some examples. So if we create an ideal um, Bose gas that's excited, um, the momentum and the rapidity should be exactly the same, and they are. Um, if you get a tungsten O gas, the momentum and the rapidity should be very different, and that's what we get. And we can actually make this quantitative. I don't have three periods on there yet. We're working on it, um, but they it's explicable. Um, uh, but then, if you go into this middle regime where you have the scar state, um, you get some difference between the momentum and the rapidity distribution, some exact distribution. We have no idea how to that. That's beyond all of our skills. Um, so uh, this quantitative comparison we don't have. Um, and so that's inspiring people to generate new uh, theoretical descriptions. One promising one is called generalized hydrodynamics, which takes a local density approximation to hydrodynamics with uh, generalized Gibbs ensembles. With um, and, uh, and we need to incorporate interact, dipolar interactions and quenches and stuff to, to, to really figure it out. It works in some cases that David also showed uh, David Weiss, uh, we want to apply it to these sorts of systems to really understand these exotic use states and that. Okay. Um, so, with that, I'm going to summarize. Um, so, we took dysprosium, which is this new quantum gas that we uh, introduced uh, about um, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago at this point, um, put it into one dimension, and we're able to realize two quantum versions of, of toys. I don't know if they call the Archimedes screw real toy, but it's kind of neat. Um, we showed unusual topological pumping with this in energy space. We showed that you can control thermalization of the near integral system that's strongly interacting. And then uh, combining this, we're able to find uh, some brand new many, bar, many body versions of star states using these 1D gases. And you can read more in these papers or reach out to me and uh, ask me questions. So again, this is my group. Um, I just want to mention two other, um, uh, maybe three other projects. Uh, that we do in my research group. Uh, we have made a, I think is a really neat breakthrough. We've been able to create the first optical lattice 
that actually vibrates, that has sounds, that has phonons to measure the linear Goldstone uh, dispersion. So, you know, if you're thinking, oh, you know, those, those optical lattice systems, they, you don't really emulate solid state because solid state, you know, makes a sound, right? Uh, if you don't have phonons, you're missing a lot of the ingredients in the soup. Um, but now we've put those, those ingredients back in using the focal cavity QD, which is a technique that we have uh, developed. And we can actually have a lattice that vibrates. We put a BC in there, and now you have a vibrating super solid in the system. Okay, it needs, and there's a lot of new stuff we're going to do with that. Um, tangentially, we're using spins coupled to confocal cavity QED to realize quantum optical neural networks, spin glasses. I'm fascinated by spin glasses. Now we can make, for the experts in the audience, we can make replicas, compare replicas, and hopefully see replica breaking symmetry. Um, we've invented a new type of microscope called the SRAM scope. Scanning quantum cryogenic gamma microscope. Okay, it works. I say scram a lot today. It's um, <laughs> not the best acronym, but uh, but it's a, a device that traps a quantum gas um, arbitrarily close to a real material that's cryogenically cooled. And recently, we did this um, with iron superconductors uh, and these uh, nickel superconductors uh, with Ian Fisher's group and, at Stanford, and we were able to use this to image. Uh, electron transport as we cooled it down through the pneumatic transition where the electrons decide to uh, conduct more easily in one crystal axis than a different one. And we can actually locally measure that and understand a little bit more about that phase transition. And now uh, we uh, have new funding to develop a new experiment. We call it the CADMAT experiment. We're using these confocal cavities with moraine materials to strongly couple the two uh, light in these materials to try to affect many body properties and we're very excited so stay tuned about that uh, in the coming years uh, and of course in all of these projects I'm always looking for excellent uh, students and uh, postdocs and now I thank you for your patience. Floor is open for questions. Everybody in TV land. Yeah and those online please type your Type your questions in the chat box or just unmute yourselves. Hi. Uh, so maybe a simple question, but um, in the polarization rate of the function of uh, theta, yeah. shouldn't that have gone to zero? Shouldn't it have been non monotonic because the two type of is a zero interaction? Yes, 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 you're a white variant. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, there's a complication in the system, um, which for a seminar I would have explained the equivalent. Okay. Um, and that it's not just one tube. I actually have a thousand tubes. And so one tube is close enough to its neighboring tube that the dipolar interaction uh, can influence atoms in both tubes. Okay. Now that doesn't violate the one dimensionality because all the degrees of freedom of the particles are still one dimensional. But it does mean that you have coupling between the tubes. So you kind of think about this system as uh, many different colors of particles all in the same tube. And those those different colors interact uh, with intratube di dipolar interactions and intertube dipolar interactions, and so you can account for that mathematically. We did, you know, you can sum up all of this stuff, and that's what goes into that U DDI is a, fun, a, a theta, all of that. So um, and it has some measured properties, and when you square that and divide by the collision energy, multiply by gamma squared, you get that theory curve value. So it tells us that we can understand this coupling between tubes, this different flavor coupling, well enough to correspond to our data from our free parameters. So that complication is why it doesn't drop to 55. Now, we've made tubes that are separated by factor of two, which drops the DDI by factor of eight, and that's something we can explore in the future, just to test that out. Um, but I will say one more thing. Uh, when we did these rapidity measurements, and I don't have the theory curves because Papers in preparation, I, I, you know, we're tweaking it still a little bit and I don't want to put it up there yet. But we do, I, I am comfortable to say that we do have very strong theory experiment correspondence, even when you have the intertube coupling. So I think from the quantum Monte Carlo cooperation perspective, we understand that. Thanks, that's a pseudo observation. So these energy content we are also having. They are arrays. Now they're, um, there's, there's probably some effect, but if you look at the energy scales, the measurement of energy and the measurement of lifetimes happen much faster than the time scales that I showed for thermalization. 
And so you might uh, be able to convince yourself that that energy scale is just too minuscule to affect that, that stability diagram. The intertube energy scale is really low compared to what I've shown. Yes. Uh, sorry, were you done with? Uh, yeah. I want to make clear Yes, it's, in fact, that's the title of that paper. We didn't use the word star. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it is quintessentially a pre-thermal state. Um, it's strongly interacting, yeah, pre-thermal state. Yeah. Yeah, um, so in spectrum, you can see Creating some whole models based on are there connections to what we observe in nature and materials or other systems? Do you know? So I don't know about any connections to um, to naturally occurring materials or even engineered materials that are touching a substrate, so not isolated. What I would say kind of philosophically about this, this research program, like the direction, is that we're trying to understand this, the scope of possibility that can happen uh, using these like test beds um, in non-equilibrium quantum many body physics to build intuition, to stimulate new theories. And then hopefully at some point down the line, we can feed that back to material synthesis. Um, of course, materials are always complicated because they're always touching something. Um, they're not suspended by lasers or magnetic fields, but the intuition might help us in the future. So like evading thermalization, can we use it or something? <laughs> ah, so in, in terms of that part of the question, um, well, if you are putting on your engineer cap, right, you want to be a quantum engineer, um, then you're going to be building complex many body systems that do computation or sensing. And these systems, you know, and you can try to cool them down to the ground state and keep them there all the time. That's these big gill fridges that they're talking about. Uh, um, but you know, you might get sick of that strategy. You might want to operate at some fine energy density, right? Because that's just a heck of a lot easier to do. And so then you want to figure out is there a way to operate this quantum antibody system at finite energy density without it immediately thermalizing to all of the, the nearby chaotic states. So that's more of the direct application of this than what we usually talk about when we're motivating this, is that it allows you to figure out ways to isolate things that are not the ground state. Thank you. Yes. So the, the topological subject, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of reminds of the quantum mode. Is there any charge that you can, and like the space in the middle, do they have some fractional charge that you can measure? Gosh, I don't know. You're going beyond my understanding. Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, there. I don't know if there's a charge here. It's not a, a continuum system, but it's beyond my understanding. There's only one paper I've ever found about this system. Uh, it doesn't mention anything like that. Like you know, so in some sense, the phase is the thing that keeps track of where you're on the Riemann surface. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean. Again, like this is really brand new, and I'd love to talk with theorists who are interested in helping me figure out what this all means. This is one of the examples in my life where I've actually discovered something experimentally, so it's like yay experimental. But that means that you know there aren't just a there isn't a body of literature that I can point back, at least not that I'm aware of, that tells me exactly what I've done. Can you please? Uh, I missed your first two words. Oh, in the Yes. Are you expecting the state to be, you know, an equitable, I mean, under a general Hamiltonian or the equivalent of the Hamiltonian that said there are powerful, not uh, equitable, but you were able to elicit the uh, term from the uh, What's going on? I mean, you're dancing around the, the, the confusion that I uh, spoke to you about, which is that. It seems weird, right? We know that the, the microscopic model is not replicable. It has um, the trap, it has the dipolar interaction. But for most of the measurements we've made, um, qualitatively, it looks indistinguishable from the minimal model, which is integrable. Why that is, I don't know. I mean, it could be some accidents of energy, like energy barriers, 
I doubt that just because that's a very weak thing, but maybe that's all it is. Um, I think it's because the dipole interactions give you some subtle change to the two and many body correlations that actually make it um, make those matrix elements to collapse zero, or at least evades them long enough to get to the non-interacting regime. I don't know how that happens. Um, so in the closed gas case, uh, I don't know if this works collect for the collective system, but you can you know, cause other ways of transitioning to the next upper state by just, you know, just pushing the whole thing uh, on resonance you know, between the gaps. Is there any chance that you can cause transitions without going through the Archimedes screw? Yeah, so that's a very important sort of point is that um, actually I don't know how to do that. It's not as simple as like taking a microwave field or a raw transition to do that because the, in the beginning and in states are very complicated many body weight functions that I don't know how to dial in in a spectroscopic sense. So you're right, I could do the Newton's cradle and pick the thing, slide it, whatever. But what that does, like in the Newton's cradle, is that it excites you into all of the um, generic chaotic states at that, at that energy density, not the very rare scar state. That takes a very careful preparation scheme. And that's what defines it as a scar state transition. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I, it's similar mechanism. I don't know the exact vertex that does that in the most hybrid model. I could probably look it up. Um, but uh, yes, uh, it's basically because integrability works in these systems because you know uh, the order of operations of collisions. So like particle A first collides with particle B, and then particle C, you can write down that order. And that's how you get beta on SOTS, uh, constructor wave function. When you have three body interactions, some of those types, not all, but some of those types of uh, three body interactions lose the ability to get that right ordering. And then you can't write down the beta on SOTS wave function and solve it. So like if you had a three body interaction with all of them in the same spot, like three contact interactions, that still preserves integrability because all three are symmetric and they do it all at the same time. And so it doesn't matter which up, but when you get two and then one over here, that, that violates it. Because it's not really symmetric anymore. So, um, yeah, and that's that's what we found. At least it seems consistent. So, with our data. I just want to follow up with the last question, which is um, talk, speaking about unit chain dipole interaction. Yes. In the first step result, if you're if you're rotating the field, uh -huh. then those inner chain interactions change too. Change. In a different direction than the interchange, right? Uh, not always the difference, sometimes the same. It's uh, it's not really, you know, it's correlated obviously, but it doesn't always do the same sign. But you know what it is, right? It's just a geometry problem. So, you know, you can calculate that and incorporate it in. And that's what we did for that problem. Yeah. And also, it's what we did for the Monte Carlo simulation, which is the last slide, you know, preprint will be available soon. And uh, you can trust my, maybe trust me in saying that. Uh, it actually the theory of the experimental correspondence are pretty darn good. So, but yeah, you'd like to do it experimentally. Okay, there are no further questions. Um, let's thank that again.